أصحابه وأحبائه أجمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدوا صدق الله مولانا العظيم وقال جل جلاله عما نواله في مقام آخر إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصل عليه All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created this creation and gave man the most superior status in this creation. One often wonders why man was given such a superior status. What does man possess that he deserved this title? If you look at the physical nature of our existence, you will find that there are elements within the animal kingdom that possess superior quality in different respects. So physically, before our own eyes, there are elements of creation that have superior physical power, whether that be the power of vision, or muscular power, or other forms of power. But yet Allah ascribes us to be the best of creation. Then spiritually, or or should I say theologically, we are prone to error, we are prone to wrong, to mistake. Paradoxically, you have a creation known as angels. They are far more... Uh, pious than us they are free from error they are free from sin but the status that has been afforded to man <clears throat> the status that has been afforded to mankind or certainly certain elements of mankind no angel has seen such a status so the question that really needs to be asked what is there in man 
that has elevated him in the eyes of his creator whilst on the face of it there is a whole catalogue of deficit in him but despite that Allah has given him this status in the world that we live in today I often describe our existence as mere firefighting all we do on a day-to-day -day basis is deal with problems today we have a problem to deal with we are we allocate our resources to the solution of that problem tomorrow there's another problem and then there's another problem and we seldom get the opportunity to stand back and to think what's all this really about are we just here to firefight what are we doing here is the object of our creation simply to be given a herd of problems to deal with and to deal with those problems successful companies never run just on the basis of dealing with problems that they encounter successful enterprises are successful because they predict they project they foresee and they take steps in that direction and whilst we are quite happy to engage in this exercise in a commercial arena feasibilities future planning all of these concepts apply to us in the commercial arena but in our personal lives we hardly have the time to do that when we go to mosques or religious lectures we are bombarded with information do this do this don't do this do this do this and let's face it we spend most of our life just juggling with what to do and what not to do it's a huge juggle uh, in in a non-muslim country you have issues of halal and haram you, you, you're always alert of course in a Muslim country uh, Alhamdulillah you don't have that issue but then you, you've got t time to balance with Salah your obligations of Salah I often ask this question to people that when you feel hungry you don't need to be educated by a college university or a, or a professor to go and eat hunger itself dictates your behavior and you will go to food that's your fitra your nature why couldn't allah have in, in, in engendered this in our nature that when the time for salah came we automatically prayed why couldn't allah just in, in, in calculated this in our uh, uh, um, psychologies that what is right we all agree on what is right what is wrong we all agree on what is wrong after all if, if it was as simple as that no one would go wrong no one intentionally wants to do wrong even if you ask a, a, a criminal do you really thrive on this lifestyle do you really well he may be uh, uh, obnoxious at his answer but if you say okay well forget about you your children would you like your children to be like you and even the most heinous criminal would say no i would like my children to have a better future i would like so what is a better future no one wants to be in the wrong but why couldn't Allah have just incalculated that in our systems in our psycho systems so that we all agree on what is right and that's and that's it you see we are so engaged in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, um, uh, lives that we seldom have the opportunity to sit back and proactively think of what this hoo-ha really is all about and once uh, 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 I sat in the company of a faqir who said to me, he said, you know the beautiful thing about this rat race? You know what I mean when I refer to this term, rat race? It's a very common term used in Europe and America, rat race. He said, you know, the amazing thing with this rat race is, wherever you are in the race, whether you're ahead or whether you're behind, he said, you're still a bloody rat. <laughs> Why? Because the idea is, to simply uh, work to live or live to work anyway let's not get into that the idea is that you're just working on a day-to-day -day basis a very machine-like life in the morning you switch on 
You've got a whole herd of duties now to juggle with during the day. Those duties range from duties towards Allah, of course, Salah and everything, all very well. Then you have duties uh, to your family. Then you have uh, uh, work-based duties. And all you're doing on a day-to-day basis is working like a machine, operating like a machine, until you, your head hits the pillow or you get to bed. But even then, you're, you're not s- uh, technically uh, uh, switched off because the TV's on. And when the TV's off, uh, the lights are closed, then you switch off and the machine goes off. But there's got to be more to life than this lifestyle. There's got to be more to this whole saga. You have to think and say to yourself that, um, look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, there is only one, if your name was Muhammad Hussein, I'm just giving an example. If your name was Muhammad Hussein and you say to yourself, there is only one Muhammad Hussein in this whole universe. You could try to clone him as much as you like, but this Muhammad Hussein is one and exclusive. Why? Someone somewhere has given that exclusivity to this person looking in the mirror. Someone somewhere has taken the time to design you, to design your physical features, your psychology. Your You haven't made these choices. These choices were made for you. Now, if I was to ask uh, an elderly gentleman in this uh, audience to carry this pulpit, if it is a pulpit, um, to uh, Johannesburg on your shoulder, I think certain members of the audience would quite uh, comfortably refer me to a psychiatric ward. Why? They would say, you are asking an old man to carry a weight which, which, which clearly it's, it's beyond him to, to, to carry on his shoulders all the way to Johannesburg. So if I was to uh, 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 want to give weight or put weight upon someone, I would clearly calculate. There's a certain exercise I w- that would go on in my mind. And through that exercise, I would see how much can this person bear. And Allah says, La I don't put any weight on anyone that they can't bear. So these problems that you have, I'm not saying problems are a good thing, but someone somewhere has actually taken the time out to look at you and say, okay, I'm going to give you this problem. And life isn't just about problem solving. Of course, problem solving is an integral part of life, but there's got to be more to life. And we simply don't give ourselves the time. And in the world we live, the only objective of life, as we see it, is the pursuit, or as the American Constitution sees it, the pursuit of happiness. But is it really happiness? Is it really real happiness in real terms? If you ask someone who uses drugs, that when you are high, or as they call it on the street, when you ask stoned certainly that's the term we use in europe when you are stoned do, are you really happy or is that short term happiness that you have really worth it in the overall scheme of things if you ask an alcoholic are you really happy those few moments when you are intoxicated are those few moments really worth it or you ask someone who's uh, uh, into another addiction the point is Is our life in this world just about getting the greatest degree of happiness? Is that what it's all about? How do we explain imbalances in this world where you have, and I don't want to go into this too much, but where you have innocent people dying from in tsunamis and you have sinners (laughs) who lead perfectly normal lives and on the face of it, they, 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 they... lead prosperous lives so how do you explain these imbalances anyway this it's a bit of a campaign to go out and explore the world outside i think the first world you need to explore explore is your own world so the question you need to ask we need to ask ourselves what are we doing here someone somewhere has certainly given us the time of day and designed us you could have been born a hundred years ago in 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 uh, australia You could have been born into a different family. But someone somewhere made these decisions for you. And you have to ask yourself these questions. And this voyage or this quest of knowing yourself is a very Islamic quest. But the problem is we don't have time for that. 
We are bombarded with so much information, we don't know how to cope with it. Do this, do this, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do this. We seldom take that time out. But this quest of knowing yourself, knowing your reality, is a thoroughly Islamic quest. And I don't want to repeat too much literature from the Quran and Sunnah because Alhamdulillah, you're a very, uh, you're a very aware audience of the sources. But the Prophet وسلم, says, "Man arafa nafsahu, faqad arafa rabbahu." He who knew himself knew his Lord. So knowing yourself is a is an activity which is a very very Islamic activity. But I want to set the scene of this conversation, this discourse, from, because of course the fountain of knowledge, as far as we are concerned ultimately is the Qur'an. And of course, the best explanation of that is the Hadith. So this question, these questions which I have posed to you, that who, who we really are, what are we doing here? What are these problems all about? We say day after day, oh Allah, I want to lead a problem-free life, I want to lead a problem-free life, no more problems, no more problems. We assume that the, 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 the more religious we become, the less the problems we have. And now, I don't know about Afro South Africa, now there's a, in, in Europe there's a Taviz culture that every problem has a Taviz to it. Oh yes, there was a gentleman in Europe who was advertising a Taviz for uh, uh, protecting your car from the, um, uh, the, the radar, so you won't get caught speeding. And these suckers went and bought these Taviz, and they were doing 90 miles an hour on the uh, motorway thinking, well, we're covered. Until one day one of the punters found that he was clocked. And the summons came through, so he went to the guy and he said, well, I want my money back. He said, why? He said, I got flashed. So he looked, he said, oh, ah, I see. Ah, no, 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 there's another explanation to it. Someone's done black magic on your tires. <laughs> Not on your car, on your tires. The thing is, there's this Tavi's culture, that there's got to be a Tavi's for every problem. And, 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 We've got to find a solution to every problem. And we've got to use whatever is in, in our power to deal with that problem. And I often give this example, and I, I'm sure you'll appreciate this. A lot of you in this audience know uh, Hazrat Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, rahimahumullah. Uh, I don't need to say a lot about him. You know a lot about him. But just one, one thing about him. Such is the nature of his spiritual power that he says... Uh, um, this whole uh, this whole earth I see it in the palm of my hand like a mustard seed that this is a very spiritual statement inshallah uh, I'll elaborate on this some other day and he says I have so much power and all of this and, 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 and such is the great virtue of his power now if you look at his power his spiritual power and if you go and trace his ancestry back You've come in his ancestry to someone called Hazrat Imam Hussein, radiallahu an. The 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 great 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 grandson is saying, "I have so much power," and his ancestor couldn't defeat the army of Yazid. It doesn't add up. Didn't he have spiritual power? Didn't he have that power? Come on, if you had a problem, wouldn't you use your power? I mean, even the law allows self-defense. Imam Hussein could have used his spiritual power in self-defense at least. Come on, I mean, who would have criticized Hazrat Imam Hussein for using uh, power in self-defense? But no, he did not use his spiritual power, yet he had so much power at his disposal. Couldn't he have thought that I should, I should uh, to solve this problem, I should uh, use a different strategy, I should save my family, look, there's innocence at stake? Wouldn't you do the same? But no, his whole psychology and the psychology of the people of Allah as far as problems are concerned, isn't that you necessarily confront a problem to solve it, is that you see the spirit behind the problem. Why is this problem? Why has this problem come to me? Clearly my creator <coughs> has implemented this problem for me. And he says this in the Quran. مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Allah says, there is no problem. مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ There is no problem that comes to you that comes to you without the permission of Allah. 
So every problem that is that comes to you is authorized by Allah. So the first thing is that your lives and whatever surrounds your life has been pre-planned for you. And I don't wish to embark upon a discussion on Qadr. Well, if everything has been decided, then let's just carry on leading life. No. Allah has given us choice within that. It's not that we are uh, 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 void of choice. Choice is something that is an integral part of our creation. But the question is, where are we going? All right, let me put it to you this way. Is there anyone in this audience that actually believes that we are able to do something as an act of worship that as a result of that, we are able to confront Allah on the Day of Judgment and say, well, I've done X act. And on that act, I deserve to go to Jannah. Or has anyone done such an act? The reality is, no matter what we do, there's still no guarantee. Allah could accept it, alhamdulillah, the Day of Judgment, or He may not accept it. I often give the example in Hadith literature where a person is presented before Allah and the angels say, this person worshipped Allah for his uh, entire adult life, stood on one foot, and he dedicated himself exclusively to Allah and he didn't uh, 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 bother with the world. He just exclusively dedicated himself to Allah. Allah looks at, upon this person and says, I tell you what, you go to Jannah on my mercy. And this person says, oh, no, 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 hang about. I, I need to uh, uh, have a bit of justice here. I need, to, I need to, there needs to be some justice here. On your mercy? On what basis do you want me to uh, uh, invoke your mercy? I dedicated my life to you. And Allah said, you want my justice? On the day of judgment, Allah will then give him his justice. Allah will say, tell me, where did you uh, uh, worship? He said, I worshipped in such and such a place. Tell me the geographical location. He names the geographical location. Allah said, you worship me in that location, but the place where you worship me, did you own that place? He said, no. So you worship me on someone else's land. You usurp the right of another and then you worship. Don't you know that when you usurp someone's right and worship me, I don't accept that worship. He said, well, in that case, I'll invoke your mercy and I'll go to Jannah. The point I'm trying to make is, we don't really have any serious guarantees. The reality is, on the Day of Judgment, the only two things that we can rely on that will let us off scotch-free is A, Allah looking at us and saying, all right, you know what, I'll, I'll be merciful to you. Go on, you... Uh, Go on, I'll let you go. On my mercy. Or there's a second uh, 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 way that we can get off uh, 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 on the Day of Judgment. And that is to the, through the intercession of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or through the intercession of another. But the point is, no matter how much we do in terms of worship, do we really guarantee ourselves a better life in the hereafter on account of that worship? And if the reality is we don't, then what are we doing here? Where are we going? There has to be a greater objective and to this Allah uh, addresses us in the Qur'an in a very simple way. But if you think about the simplicity, there is a lot that can be gained from this. Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we created man, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ well, insa illa liyabudun. We created man and jinn except to worship us. Now we take this for faith value and we say, oh, that means just to do our ritual worship. But no, if you think about it, there's more to it. The greatest tafsir of the Quran that has ever been written is called the tafsir of Ibn Abbas. And in the tafsir of Ibn Abbas, he commentates on this verse, illa liyabudun, to, to, we created you to worship us. He said, what is worship? So that you can know us. So worship itself is not an end. It's not an objective. Worship is a vehicle to an end. And what is that end? What is that objective? The objective is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the object of our creation as the Quran introduces it to us is to know Allah. Ibadah is a vehicle that leads us to that path but let's face it how many of us really do worship for that purpose and then let's look at the uh, uh, definition of worship is worship simply the ritual worship that you, we do what is the uh, istilahi meaning of worship Ibadah well there's the external meaning of Ibadah and that is to worship Allah in accordance with the prescribed manners taught to us by Sharia 
That's the external meaning of ibadah. But there's another meaning of worship. And that is to do the zikr of Allah in your daily lives voluntarily and involuntarily. And Allah describes this in the Quran. Alladina yazkurun Allah qiyaman wa qudun wa ala junubim. They worship Allah standing, sitting, and even lying down. But this worship is not restricted to the prescribed and ritual worships that we do. Because whatever worship you do, prescribed or unprescribed, the title to it is called zikr. What is it called? What is it called? Zikr. And what is the meaning of zikr? Zikr means remembrance, to remember. Now, um, I have never met this gentleman sitting in front of me before. But if I say to you, do you remember last year we met in Hajj? Now he will jog his memory, and he will jog his memory, he'll jog his memory, and he'll say, sorry, I don't even think I did Hajj last year. You're mistaken. But if he did do Hajj, he will jog his memory again and again. There will be a process that goes on in his mind. And he will think. He will remember, remember. Ah, we met at such and such a door outside the masjid. We said salah. Now I remember. Whatever worship you do, my dear brothers. Whatever worship you do. The title to that is zikr. And what is zikr? Remembrance. Remembrance of who? Allah. You remember Allah? You remember Allah? You only remember someone if you knew him in the first place. Do we really know Allah? The answer is, we know Allah. Everyone sitting in this audience has spoken to Allah. Everyone sitting in this audience has interacted with Allah. Everyone, you may not believe this, that memory chip within your mind may have been removed. But every one of us had, has had a personal relationship with Allah. In fact, even the kafir has had that relationship whereby he has interacted with Allah. But the problem is he has come into this body. And when the soul came into this body, up to a certain time that body was covered. There was an insurance policy that applied to this body. And the name of that insurance policy was Ma'sumiya. Ma'sumiya is innocence. Up to the age of uh, 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 puberty, you are covered by that insurance. But you could do whatever wrong you do. Your angels won't write wrong. Why? Because your soul, which is pure, supersedes your body. And now your body is incapable of doing wrong. And your body will uh, 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 not be uh, 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 tormented or will not be uh, 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 made culpable for the actions that it does before puberty. But as soon as puberty kicks in, now the body is in charge. And on the, uh, when you go in your grave, your soul comes back in charge, but now the, uh, the fate of the soul is the fate of the body. But the point I'm trying to make is that ultimately we have a background, we have a past and when we begin to know what our past was, then we can begin to know what our future is. And when we know what our past and our future is, then we could begin to make sense of what this world is really about and what this existence is really about. Whether someone knows or whether he doesn't know what his future is, that's not the point. The point is having a plan of action in mind. What is my objective? To simply say, I want to do ibadah to know Allah, Theoretically sounds good, but what practical steps do you take in that direction? That is not a question that can be answered at a generic level for me to say, well, here's a formula. Everyone sitting in this audience needs to embark upon that quest. And the answer as to what steps you need to take towards that quest is not a generic answer. It's a specific answer. Like you are specific in this creation, there is... A, a specific answer to you and when you embark upon that quest and if you are sincere in that quest Allah responds but remember don't think that there is only one way if there was a generic one way and one answer in this quest no Allah says in the Quran وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَّهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا those who strive in our way وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا i.e. strive in our way for us. This is a quest ultimately for Allah. But 
The quest of knowing yourself. He who knows himself knows his Lord. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا Look at the uh, uh, accommodation of diversity in Allah's regime. لَنَّهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا We will surely, surely show them one of our many ways. Ladies and gentlemen, there's not one way to Allah. The way you are exclusive, you have an exclusive way to Allah. That path is your path. Your neighbor has a different path. His neighbor has a different path. But what is that path? An alim sitting on a pulpit cannot answer that. An alim can give you general direction from the Quran and Sunnah. But that quest is a personal quest which you must embark upon. And I promise you, if you embark upon that quest, it will make not only your worship, your prescribed worship meaningful, it will make your unprescribed worship meaningful. It will make your whole life more meaningful. Your interactions with your environment more meaningful. Why? Because ultimately you will know that whatever the case, I have a destination to reach. No matter how much you try to fight with me, no matter how much you try to embroil me in a dispute, I've got a flight to catch on tomorrow night and I will only engage with you until a certain time and after that time, I know that's the cutoff period. I've got to go to the airport, otherwise I'll miss my flight. Why? Because my psychology is, I'll deal with you, I'll deal with the problem at hand, but I've got somewhere to go. I've got somewhere to go. It's in the back of my mind. I've, it's in the back of my mind. A traveler always is more interested in his journey. And anything that he deals with in the interim is dealt with on that basis. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all travelers in this world. Who is here permanently? We have a destination, but let's make the most of our journey. And let's pray to Allah today in Juma, in this blessed month of Rajab. Oh Allah, give us a better purpose in life. Give us that higher goal in life, rather than simply the rigmarole that we lead in life for the sake of it. وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاهُ الْمُبِينَ Subhanallah Walhamdulillah